Hi and welcome to the Bible Channel, a podcast supported by Christadelphianvideo.org. Three studies for you now, Israel, Hamas, Hezbollah. The Christadelphians present a three-part series showing how Bible prophecies from thousands of years ago impact the Middle East conflict right now. Palestinians gained their name from the ancient Philistines who lived in the area around modern-day Gaza. Bible prophecies speak of this looming last day conflict involving Gaza, Lebanon and Israel, just prior to the Battle of Armageddon itself. The battle will centre on the future of Jerusalem, the Temple Mount and the Dome of the Rock. The Bible shows how Jesus will return to judge the world in righteousness and bring a time of peace and harmony for all mankind, ruling the world from Jerusalem for a thousand years. In this time, Jews and Arabs, indeed all the world, will be blessed by the presence on earth of God's Son, our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. The present conflicts in Israel and many other places are signs that the Lord's return is near. We must be living our lives in faithful, godly ways as we wait patiently for his coming. Hope you enjoy this three-part series delivered to us by Ken Whitehead. Thank you for listening. God bless. Yes, indeed. Where is the world headed with all that's going on, particularly in the Middle East right now? Remember on the 7th of October, just uh, almost two weeks ago, Hamas terrorists from Gaza launched what they call Operation Al-Aqsa Flood. And using the words Al-Aqsa, of course, they're referring to what's known by the Jews as the Temple Mount, that area where Al-Aqsa Mosque is in the very centre of Jerusalem. So this conflict really centres upon Jerusalem and its future. Well, after that horrible attack, dreadful, dreadful things going on that the terrorists perpetrated in southern Israel. Wild celebrations took place on the streets of Gaza, men, women and children singing and dancing and rejoicing at these terrible attacks. And around the world, people took to the streets to support them, in some cases shouting out death to the Jews. Terrible things going on in our world. Where's it all going to go from here? Well, The problem really is that the world doesn't understand what's happening in the Middle East because they've thrown their Bibles in the dustbin. We suggest to you very strongly, don't throw your Bible away because it's talking about the the very events that are taking place now in the Middle East. You can turn to your Bible and see these things predicted in the very pages of the Scripture, talking about these things, our own day. Well, the world has actually descended into madness, and that's why the world is in the state that it's in. It's discarded the Bible, discarded God, put him out of the picture. Well, the Bible foretells times like this and says, this is going to be the time of madness that will be just before the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Isaiah chapter 5 talks about madness. Those people who call evil good and good evil put darkness for light and light for darkness. Well, The Bible says, God says, Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. People who think they can solve the problems of the world without bringing God into the picture. James in the New Testament, James chapter 3, talks about worldly wisdom and he says, This wisdom doesn't descend from above, from God. It's worldly. He says it's sensual. It comes from human depravity. And he goes on to say, For where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. That's certainly our world today. And if you come to Revelation chapter 16, where in fact the word Armageddon appears on the only occasion in the Bible, we'll talk about that shortly. Leading up to Armageddon, we read that there are these spirits of madness, unclean spirits. That is, in using the word spirits, it speaks of ideas, ideologies of the world in the last days. For example, the growing up of this concept of wokeness, this fabricated sense of injustice and and grievance 
against society in general that pervades all sorts of thinking in our world today. And the scripture goes on to say that it will have a powerful influence. It'll go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. And we can see the disturbances everywhere in our streets, protest after protest after, over all sorts of issues, as people rail against the uh, society as it exists today. Well, God says that's going to bring everybody to this great final battle as the Lord Jesus Christ returns to judge the world in righteousness. Now, we're going to be talking about things to do with war and conflict and troubles, but we don't condone violence of any kind. We, we look ahead to the soon return of the Lord Jesus Christ to the earth, and he will be known as the Prince of Peace. So all we're doing really is making commentary on these things relative to the Bible's message. The Lord Jesus Christ will bring an end to wars and to cruelty and injustice all around the world. He'll bring in tremendous changes, marvellous changes and improvements so that mankind everywhere will live in a marvellous new world. So in our talks and our videos, what we do is we simply report on the world events as they relate to Bible prophecy and as signs that the Lord Jesus Christ is very near at hand. Now we're talking about Israel, and Israel of course is descended from Jacob and is sometimes, or well, quite often in the Bible, called Jacob as a nation. So in Jeremiah chapter 30 we read this about the return of the Jewish people to their own land in the last days just before Jesus returns. Lo, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will bring again the captivity of my people Israel and Judah, saith the Lord. That is, of course, the divisions of Israel will be healed and they will be uh, Israel and Judah living in the land in the last days when Jesus reigns and comes to reign upon the earth. I will cause them to return to the land that I gave to their fathers. God gave them this land, what the Bible is saying, and they will possess it. For thus saith the Lord, we have heard a voice of trembling, of fear, and not of peace. That's what we're hearing right now. Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. So the nation of Israel, known as Jacob, as natural Israel, the natural tribes of Israel, uh, coming down from Abraham through Isaac and Jacob, this terrible time of trouble isn't over yet, and perhaps it'll get even worse than it is now. But the nation, he shall be saved out of it, says the prophet. You know, the fact is that Jesus was born a Jew. Jesus was crucified, King of the Jews. And he says in John chapter 4, verse 22, these are the, uh, the words of the very Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Salvation is of the Jews. So the Jews are the chosen people of God. And salvation for all peoples, whether they're Jew or Gentile, non-Jew, comes through the people of Israel and their Jewish Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, he's going to return... And though the Jews now, as a nation, certainly don't uh, put their trust in Jesus as their Saviour, their Messiah, when he returns, the prophet Zechariah has some things to say about it. The Jewish people will say to Jesus, What are these wounds in thine hands? So even though he's immortal, and he's in heaven now, and he has a, an eternal body, he still shows the marks in his hands. And as he did to show Thomas uh, in the Gospels, uh, look at these wounds, put your finger in the, in the holes in my hands and thrust your hand into my side where the spear went in. Well, people will say, what are these wounds in thine hands? And he shall answer, what a beautiful answer it is. Those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. And so Jesus will still regard the Jewish people as his friends. He'll call them to him and they will come to him with great sorrow, knowing that they've made many, many mistakes in the past about their view of Jesus Christ. Chapter 12 says, They shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn as one mourns for his only son, and shall be in bitterness as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. In that day there shall be a great mourning in Jerusalem, that for 2,000 years they've rejected Jesus as their Messiah, but he has come to save them in their direst need, as it certainly will be, in the very near future, the Bible tells us. But they will be saved. They are the people of God. Now, when we come to this Operation Al-Aqsa flood that's been begun by the terrorists, 
we read in Zechariah chapter 12 about Jerusalem. You can see on the map there that in the centre of Jerusalem is this uh, area called the Temple Mount by the Jews and Christians and al Haram al-Sharif by the Muslims. There is the Dome of the Rock with the Golden Dome that everybody recognises. Nearby you can see the Al-Aqsa Mosque. And uh, that, of course, is the name uh, that uh, is given to this, uh, this uh, Al-Aqsa flood that the terrorists have begun. There's the Western Wailing Wall just outside that compound, which is, of course, the holy place for the Jews to worship. Now, the Muslims call this area their third holiest site in their religion. What do we read in Zechariah chapter 12, same chapter that we were just looking at uh, where the Jews recognise Jesus? At that time, there's going to be a lot of trouble just at the time that Jesus is ready to return. In that day will I make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. All that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces, though all the people of the earth be gathered together against it or towards it. And so this uh, conflict in the Middle East, of course, does affect all the world. It already has, but more so in the very, very near future. Now let's look at the background of the Palestinians, the Philistines, as they're called uh, in the, uh, the area that they occupied in the Old Testament, Philistines, from which we get the name Palestine. And we'll look at a passage soon in the Bible where the word Palestine appears, the only time it appears in Joel chapter 3 in the Bible. So the ancient Philistines uh, were descended from the Egyptians. We read in Genesis chapter 10 about the fact that the sons of Ham after the flood, uh, he had four sons, Cush, which uh, became uh, the area of southern, settled in uh, southern Africa, Ethiopia is sometimes translated in the Bible, southern Africa, Mitzrayim, which is Egypt, and Phut, which represents the area of northern Africa around Libya and beyond, and Canaan, which is, of course, the area of the Promised Land. So these uh, tribes that descended from Ham uh, after the flood settled in those areas. And then we read that Mitzrayim begat Ludim and Anamim and Lehabim and Naphtalim and Pathrusim and Kazlusim, out of whom came Philistim and Kaphtorim. So uh, the uh, historians uh, give us to understand that the uh, area that settled in Egypt by Mitzrayim and uh, his descendants uh, actually spawned a number of uh, other settlements nearby. And off to Crete, the island of Crete, went his descendants Kaphtor and Philistim. And later on, uh, the Philistim, the Philistines, uh, migrated across from Crete. Uh, they actually tried to uh, settle back in Egypt, but uh, they were repelled. And so they went further north uh, above the Sinai Desert into the coastal regions known today as uh, Palestine or the, uh, in particular the Gaza Strip, that area of Gaza. So uh, the Philistines settled there and of course we know that they were enemies of Israel uh, over many, many generations and uh, there today is the name uh, that originated the, Pal the Philistines as today the Palestinians. Now when the um, uh, Philistines settled there. Uh, there are a number of prophecies that uh, were given uh, later in history uh, in the Bible about the future of the Philistines or the Palestinians, we could read, uh, because they are people who live in that area. When the Bible talks in prophetic terms, it speaks of the people that live in modern days in the areas settled in the olden times. So the current Phil uh, Palestine Palestinians uh, are settled in the area that was previously occupied by the Philistines. Uh, we know, of course, of the Philistines in the Bible, um, uh, arch enemies of Israel over many generations, and we can think of Goliath, uh, the great giant of the Philistines, and many other situations. Now, the Bible says in Ezekiel chapter 25, and this is written uh, after Israel were taken off into captivity in Babylon, and talks about the future of the Philistines and the time when uh, the people of Israel would return to their land, but would still have enemies in the area that the Philistines occupied before, now known as the Palestinians. So in Ezekiel 25, and uh, from verse 15 down to 17, we have these words, Thus saith the Lord God, Because the Philistines, we could read Palestinians, have dealt by revenge and have taken vengeance with a despiteful heart to destroy it, that is to destroy Israel, for the old hatred, it's a long lasting generation after generation, old hatred, it's still there in the hearts of these people who live alongside 
of the people of Israel today. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will stretch out mine hand. This is God saying, I'm going to punish these Palestinians. I'll stretch out my hand upon the Philistines, Palestinians, and I will cut off the Kerithim. Now, the word cut off actually is the, the same Hebrew root word uh, that uh, gives its name to the Kerithim. Now, amongst the Philistines of old were these people who were particularly trained to be killers, Kerithims. Uh, and the word means cutters, slashers. In fact, if you go to Strong's Concordance, you'll read that it, uh, it can mean cutting off body parts. And in fact, Strong gives the meaning, one of the meanings is being people who behead people. These, this is exactly the terms used for Hamas. This is the kind of people that Hamas really are. And, and uh, whilst Hamas uh, is actually a series of letters from uh, Arabic origin, uh, every time a, a, a person speaking Hebrew uses that word, they're using a Hebrew word which means violence. So in Hebrew, Hamas means violence. And you can imagine every time they use that word in their own language, they're thinking of the violence of these executioners, these terrorists. Now God says, I'm going to bring my hand, stretch my hand upon these people, and in particular these terrorists, and destroy the remnant of the sea coast. And that's exactly where Gaza is, as we know, in the same area as the Philistines on the coast in time gone by. And I will execute great vengeance upon them with furious rebukes, and they shall know that I am the Lord when I shall lay my vengeance upon them. Now there's no doubt that this is a prophecy about our days. In fact, there are supporting prophecies. Let's look at Zephaniah chapter 2, which uh, again it talks about the things that will happen when God brings his punishments upon the people who live in that area alongside Israel. Look at where it's talking about. Gaza. Gaza shall be forsaken. Ashkelon, a desolation. Now, Ashkelon is actually a little village just outside the Gaza Strip at the present time, occupied by Israelis. It's been under attack from Gaza because it's quite close to the Gaza Strip. We read this. They shall drive out Ashdod at the noonday. This is Israel bringing punishments on behalf of God. Now, of course, God works in the nations. So they don't necessarily know that he's working in the nations. God can bring punishments in many ways. He can bring punishments upon people by using natural forces like earthquakes, like hail, uh, storms, floods. Uh, and the Bible does record these sorts of things. Uh, but he also uses nations, armies, to... Uh, to work vengeance and punishments upon other nations. That's how God works. You can read it in the Bible in a lot of detail in many, many places. Often it's the nation of Israel, which is used by God to punish surrounding nations. Uh, Row unto the inhabitants of the sea coast, exactly what we're talking about in the area of Gaza, and the nation of the Kerithites. Again, here they are, the executioners. The word of the Lord is against you, O Canaan, the land of the Philistines. That's Palestine today. And I will even destroy thee, that there will be no inhabitant. This is interesting, isn't it? This is God saying there will be no enemies of Israel alongside them when he has finished his judgments upon them. And what will happen? What will change? The sea coast will be dwellings and cottages for shepherds and folds for flocks. That's Israel. In time gone by, uh, down through history uh, in the Bible, uh, it's been known as a nation of shepherds and keepers of flocks. That's Israel in the future, settled, comfortable, peace, peaceful and peaceable in their own land. And the coast, look at this, shall be the, for the remnant of the house of Judah. They shall feed thereupon. In the houses of Ashkelon, this is that area that's been under attack, they will lie down in the evening, they'll feel safe and uh, peace will be surrounding them. For the Lord their God shall visit them and turn away their captivity. So they're not going to be under duress anymore. They're not going to be under fear. They're frightened to go to bed at night. They'll lie down comfortably in the evening and they will have that area for farming and for produce. Well, that's God's promise. What about Gaza and a history of recent times of what happened to Gaza? In, in the Six Day War of June 1967, Israel actually captured that area, the Gaza Strip, from Egypt and right down through the Sinai to uh, the uh, Suez Canal, in fact. 
But uh, when the Oslo Accords were under discussion in the mid-1990s and through to just past 2000, uh, when uh, Israel actually finally decided that they would agree to negotiate with the PLO, the terrorist organisation, Yasser Arafat and his Fatah group and others, they started negotiating with them and uh, President Clinton was part of those negotiations for a period of time. The idea of, of trying to set up a, a, a solution where there were two states, Palestine to have a state and Israel to have a state alongside one another. But that never became conclusive. There was never really a, a total agreement, uh, partly because uh, the uh, Palestinians uh, weren't really prepared to give Israel a state. They wanted a one-state solution in effect, and that to be a Palestinian state and Israel no longer around. And that's still really the terrorists' uh, idea. Uh, they don't want Israel to have any uh, state. In fact, they'd rather all the Jews were driven into the sea. They're making that clear. From the river to the sea, they're saying, and their supporters are shouting, meaning one state only for Palestine. You know, from the river to the sea, Palestine shall be free, they're saying. Well, um, that's their concept. They don't want any Jews to exist anywhere, in fact. So, in, in, in August 2005, Israel, under uh, Prime Minister Ariel Sharon, actually made this huge gesture trying to bring some solution following all the years of the Oslo Accords negotiations, hoping that there might be a, a reason for... Uh, the Palestinians to come to a peace agreement with them. Uh, what happened was that Israel decided they would unilaterally withdraw from Gaza and uh, leave Gaza to govern itself. Uh, and what that meant was that there were many Jews who were actually during uh, the recent period had uh, settled in Gaza alongside the Palestinians. Uh, when the Palestinians were being governed by uh, the Fatah party who were a relatively moderate political party amongst it within the PLO. Uh, so Israel said to those Jews who were settled in there, you've got to move out. There were actually 21 settlements there. Uh, about 9,000 citizens, Israeli citizens, were told by their own government to move out and find somewhere else to live. So they were evicted. And then in 2005, Gaza had about 1.3 million Palestinians in that area. And as we said, Fatah were the governing, governing party. But the next year, they held their elections, the first elections of this uh, new settled area, uh, Gaza, under their own control. And what happened was that Hamas actually won the elections by a large majority. So the Palestinians themselves put Hamas into government with a big majority. Well, what happened soon after that was Hamas actually turned on the previous governing party, the Fatah faction, and slaughtered the Fatah people in the streets of Gaza. And, and the former president, uh, the Fatah president, who was uh, Mahmoud Abbas, who lost the election, uh, lived in a, in a palace inside the enclave. He was driven out and he had to go and settle in the West Bank. And um, he and his party really retreated to the West Bank, those who remained after the slaughter. Uh, and uh, they governed that area of the West Bank under that president. Uh, of course, there's been, been no more elections since 2006 uh, in Gaza, and nor has there been in the West Bank, because Mahmoud Abbas is quite certain that um, if they held more elections, uh, that Hamas would win the elections in, uh, in the West Bank as well. So uh, he doesn't want to have any uh, elections. But on the other hand, he's not prepared to, uh, uh, to denounce Hamas for all the terrorist activity that they've been uh, involved in, and particularly this recent terrible attack, he won't uh, denounce them. Uh, I think he's rather fearful that uh, something's going to happen to him. Well, Israel, in the Bible, will take control of Gaza. The Bible prophecy tells us that. They'll control Gaza, they'll control the West Bank, and they'll control the area of Jordan, not necessarily ruling over Jordan, uh, but uh, Jordan will be well and truly under the influence and uh, uh, very friendly with Israel, such that Israel can uh, uh, make some determinations about the future of Jordan. Isaiah chapter 11 is a really, really good chapter here on that regard. <coughs> we read that um, God will assemble the outcasts of Israel from the four corners of the earth. Now, Isaiah chapter 11 is a, a chapter which details the wonderful reign of the Lord Jesus Christ 
uh, when he rules the world from Jerusalem. And some of these verses fit in that very context uh, around the time of Jesus' return and, and ruling uh, in his kingdom, which will be very soon, we believe, from many prophecies of the Bible. Now, Israel's reassembled from the four corners of the earth, from all around the world, they're back in their land. Have a look at verse 14. And, and we'll read this, first of all, from the King James Version, the authorised version, and then for a bit of detail or understanding more, we'll read from the Amplified Bible the same verse. Israel shall fly upon the shoulders of the Philistines, Palestinians, toward the west. And we know they're on the western side of the country, uh, on the edge of the Mediterranean Sea. And they shall spoil them of the east together. They shall lay their hand upon Edom and Moab, and the children of Ammon shall obey them. Now, all those areas, Edom, Moab and Ammon, are in the modern country of Jordan. You can see them on the map there, on the uh, right-hand side, uh, on the eastern side of the River Jordan and the Dead Sea. So Israel will have uh, control uh, to a large degree over that area. We know that Jordan has a peace agreement uh, with Israel. Uh, it's been in place now since, uh, well, for 30 years or more. Um, and so there's been no war between Israel and Jordan in that period of time. But the Amplified Bible just makes it a little bit clearer in a way. Ephraim and Judah, that is, that is the countries, uh, the, the former uh, divided country of, um, uh, of Israel. You can see on the, that particular map there, the kingdom of Israel in the north was all, also called the kingdom of Ephraim, the major tribe in that area, and the kingdom of Judah, the area in the south around Jerusalem and further south. Ephraim and Judah will unite and swoop down on the slopes of the Philistines toward the west. That's again the Palestinians. And they will plunder the sons, and the Amplified Bible puts in brackets there, Arabs. They will plunder the Arabs of the east. They will possess Edom and Moab, and the sons of Ammon will be subject to them. So there's a prophecy talking about Israel coming upon, swooping upon the Palestinians and also uh, achieving a control or influence over the area of Jordan. Now, that's something that's happening now and in the very near future. Swooping upon the Philistines, the Palestinians is certainly about to happen. Jeremiah chapter 31. You see, God is restoring Israel, ready for Jesus to return to the earth to be the king of the Jews, to rule the world from Jerusalem. All this is part of God's plan. And certainly it does involve judgments upon some of the enemies of Israel. Uh, and certainly it also involves Israel getting into all sorts of problems in the very last days. Uh, and particularly, as we'll see shortly, when we lead up to the Battle of Armageddon. But God is going to look after his people. This is the words of the prophet. Hear the word of the Lord, O ye nations, and declare it in the isles afar off. That includes places, of course, like Australia and New Zealand. Isles further away from the area of the Middle East. Countries that think they are not going to be affected are going to be drawn in. Now this is what God says, He that scattered Israel, that's God, will gather him and keep him as a shepherd doth his flock. Beautiful terms, wonderful words. We saw earlier on that uh, the people will dwell there as shepherds looking after their flocks and God's going to look after the nation of Israel. Like a shepherd in ancient times looked after his flock, he always was with his flock and gathered them around him. Because the Lord hath redeemed Jacob and ransomed him from the hand of him that was stronger than he. Well, there will come a time when an even stronger nation than the Palestinians will come against Israel, and that's the Battle of Armageddon. But God is going to rescue his people, even in their darkest hour. Zechariah chapter 2 tells us this, he that touches you, Israel, he that touches you touches the apple of his eye, the very pupil of God's eye, the most sensitive part in the exterior of our bodies, the pupil of the eye. But God is watching his people, and it's almost as though if you touch Israel, you're poking God in the eye. God loves his people. The Lord shall inherit Judah, his portion in the Holy Land, and shall choose Jerusalem again. So Operation al Aqsa Flood will not succeed. God is choosing Jerusalem for himself. And notice in Psalm 121, Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. God's awake. He's seeing everything that's going on now. And he will wreak his judgment 
upon those who attack his people and he will rescue his people and present them as it were as a bride to the Lord Jesus Christ. Certainly the people of God now will be the bride and in a sense Israel will also become a bride, a married one to the Lord Jesus Christ, their saviour. Let's have a look at it. It's quite clear in passages of the Bible such as Daniel chapter 11, Ezekiel chapter 38 and uh, Zechariah chapter 14. But let's look at it just very briefly. Israel will be invaded. They will be invaded by Russia and a large number of nations that come with Russia through Turkey. They will come down into Israel by land and also will send ships by sea they will actually bypass Israel to a degree uh, coming down the coast because the first uh, the first objective is to take control of Egypt. Now in time gone by, the great conquerors of the world have always known that if they wanted to uh, rule the world and solve any question of the Middle East, they needed to control Egypt. And you can think back to Alexander the Great, you can think back to Napoleon, you can think of Germany in the First World War, Hitler in, the, uh, in World War II, all wanted control over Egypt. So Daniel chapter 11 says that the king of the north, the king of this great confederacy of nations that are going to uh, precipitate the Battle of Armageddon, will first of all come down into Egypt. And as they come down, we read that Edom and Moab and Ammon, now these are the same countries we were just reading of a moment ago that Israel will have a significant influence over in the last days, now, the area of Jordan will escape this initial invasion unscathed. And the reason for that is that in, when the Battle of Armageddon takes place, those who flee from the battle, who God will protect, will actually cross over into the area of Jordan and will be protected in that area while the onslaught is taking place within the land of Israel around Jerusalem. Now, the next stage is that uh, when the great power of the north, particularly led by Russia, is based in Egypt. They'll now hear news from around Jerusalem, tidings in Israel, and that they will trouble Russia and they will now move forward against Jerusalem to bring about that great battle of Armageddon. And then many of the Jews will flee, as we said, to the protection of Jordan. Isaiah chapter 16 actually backs that up. Let mine outcast dwell with thee, Moab, be thou a covert to them from the face of the spoiler, that is, the great uh, armies from the north, the spoilers who come to take a spoil, as Ezekiel chapter 38 says. They will be protected across uh, the area of the River Jordan and the Dead Sea in the region of Jordan, modern Moab, Edom and Ammon, as mentioned there. Now, Ezekiel chapter 38, as we said, tells us about the uh, the great group of nations from uh, the north mainly, as we see there in the red, and some nations from Africa too uh, in red, all these are opposed to Israel in the last battle of Armageddon. Ezekiel 38 verse 8, just to give us uh, an idea of context here, after many days thou shalt be visited, that is, Israel will be visited in the uh, areas and the nations that they've been scattered, God will visit them, in the latter years thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword and is gathered out of many people, this is the nation of Israel, against the mountains of Israel which have been always waste, or for a long, long time, waste. But it is brought forth out of the nations and they shall dwell safely, all of them. The word safely is actually uh, just as well translated, confidently. So Israel... Uh, will not be at the mercy of the nations around them in the area of the Middle East. In other words, not certainly at the mercy of the Palestinians or the Lebanese or the Jordanians or other uh, nations nearby. They will dwell confidently and safely. And as we saw from the previous prophecy we looked at, the Pal Palestinians, the Philistines, will be dealt with and Israel will feel quite safe dwelling in their land before this great invasion of Ezekiel 38 happens. 
And as we know, the nations uh, from uh, uh, all there in the red, uh, from the Russian influence and other countries around, including Persia, which is, of course, today Iran, uh, these countries will come against Israel. They'll first go into the land of Egypt, and then they'll reverse back up and come to the land of Israel, to Jerusalem, for that great final conflict. Ezekiel 38 verse 13 mentions some Arab countries. Now let's have a look at this. These Arab countries in the green in particular, Sheba and Dedan, down you can see there to the east of Israel, southeast, the Arabian Peninsula countries, and that includes other countries nearby to Saudi Arabia, uh, such as Qatar, the uh, United Arab Emirates uh, and others. Uh, these will be favourably disposed towards Israel, but not wanting to get involved in the battle of Armageddon. And Israel will more or less be left to its own devices until Jesus actually stands on the mountains of Israel and fights for his people. Now the others with them are called the countries of Tarshish. You can see on the green there that represents Great Britain. And uh, you'll see there in uh, verse 13 of Ezekiel 38 the young lions of Tarshish. And that is other countries associated with Britain in the Commonwealth. And that would include countries like Australia, New Zealand, Canada, India. These people will speak out against the invasion, but all they'll be able to say is, Art thou come to take a spoil, Russia, and your company? Hast thou gathered thy company to take a prey, to carry away silver and gold, to take away cattle and goods, to take a great spoil? So does Russia see not only strategic interest in, in being involved and in controlling the Middle East, but also great wealth to come from there? And uh, that's certainly the case. Uh, they're going to try and take over uh, many of the resources of the world, and particularly oil and other things that they could control, including uh, uh, the uh, Suez Canal, um, you know, trade routes and so on, uh, to take control, really, of the world. Is that what you're trying to do? And that's all they can do is voice it. Perhaps at the United Nations, they might say, well, what's going on here? And we know how ruthless uh, Russia can be and will be and other countries with them at that time. Well, we're looking more at this question of how this uh, Palestinian situation is going to be resolved. And we're going to suggest to you that we'll look shortly at uh, Joel chapter 3, that uh, the Palestine and Lebanon questions, their futures, uh, will be solved by an agreement between Saudi Arabia and perhaps other countries that are uh, close to Saudi Arabia at the same time, and Israel. An agreement. Well, we know that an agreement's recently been in the wind uh, in terms of a peace deal between uh, Saudi Arabia and Israel. We'll talk about more on that in just a moment. The verse we're going to be looking at, and we'll look at it in detail, as we said shortly, but first of all, just get the gist of what Joel chapter 3 and verse 4 in particular is saying. And we're looking at Joel 3 verses 4 to 8 as having great relevance to the present situation in Palestine and Lebanon and their association with Israel and the potential for great conflict, uh, which has already got started and in, in, in could get a whole lot worse. God's saying to these places, what have you to do with me, O Tyre and Zidon? And of course, uh, that's the area of Lebanon uh, in ancient times, Lebanon today, and all the coasts of Palestine. Now, that's the only time that you'll find in your King James Bible the name Palestine. So this is obviously relevant to everything that's happening today. The very fact that it's translated Palestine draws their attention to what's going on over there alongside Israel right now. And the answer is given in verse 8, and we'll explore what the meaning of this really is in a moment. I will sell your sons and your daughters into the hand of the children of Judah, and they shall sell them to the Sabaeans. Now the Sabaeans in ancient times were the people of Saudi Arabia today. Now what's been happening with this potential peace deal that has come to the fore just uh, fairly recently, and uh, we'll show a video shortly with just a couple of clips uh, about uh, Israel and Saudi Arabia's views uh, about a potential peace deal over the last few weeks, just before um, this uh, terrible uh, cruelty that was wreaked by the terrorists in southern Israel. The Palestinians actually saw what was going on here 
and saw that they were being left out of negotiations between Israel and its peaceful neighbours. As we know, the Abraham Accords of recent years uh, have really left the Palestinian uh, question out of the picture. And the Palestinians now seeing Saudi Arabia likely to do a deal with Israel and not necessarily solving the Palestinian question before they finish that deal, they feared that they were being marginalised and uh, they were going to be left behind. So they felt that it was high time to prove that they were still relevant to what happens in the Middle East. Uh, but what the terrorists, of course, have shown is that they're not so much relevant as just absolutely cruel and savage people. Well, here's our video. There's no question. The Abraham Accords heralded the dawn of a new age of peace. But I believe that we are at the cusp of an even more dramatic breakthrough, an historic peace between Israel and Saudi Arabia. But I also believe that we must not give the Palestinians a veto over new peace treaties with Arab states. What would it take? for you to agree to normalize relations with Israel? Uh, for us, the Palestinian issue is very important. We need to solve that part. And we have a good negotiation, it's continue. Till now, we gotta see where it will go. We hope that it will reach a place that it will uh, ease the life of the Palestinians and uh, get Israel back, uh, uh, as a player in the Middle, uh, Middle East. So you think, if you were to characterize it, are you close? Every day we get closer. Are you yes, uh, clearly the Palestinians were, had good reason to be concerned that uh, they were being left out of negotiations here. And uh, as uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu said, we don't want the Palestinians having a veto over anything that we can arrange between us and uh, the uh, uh, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. We want a peace agreement and it will benefit everybody. And Mohammed bin Salman, the prince, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia, uh, now uh, affectionately known as MBS, um, ruthless man as he is, but also uh, very bright and smart, um, he knows that it's best to leave the Palestinians out of any uh, future agreement as well. So when did these two rulers first meet? Have there been things going on secretly in the background? Well, yes, in fact, uh, that's true. Uh, there was a, a, an amazing situation that arose that uh, brought about the first meeting between these two leaders. And uh, we're talking now a few years ago. Uh, it was quite a clandestine meeting and things were discussed there, um, which ultimately have led to more open discussions as time's gone on. Around the time of Donald Trump's presidency um, and, and throughout the four years, he didn't start any new wars with anybody. Uh, but uh, President Donald Trump uh, wasn't averse to approving assassinations of particularly people from uh, Iran um, and, uh, and terrorists. Uh, and uh, his own forces in uh, 2019 uh, raided the compound of the uh, head of ISIS, uh, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, and uh, as they were coming and closing in on him, uh, he activated his own suicide bomb and that was the end of him. There was another assassination where the United States were involved during that period of time, 3rd of January 2020, and uh, the uh, top general uh, of uh, uh, from Iran who promoted terrorism, Qasem Soleimani, uh, he was actually killed by the United States in a surgical drone strike on the 3rd of January uh, of that year. Now, Soon after that, in 2020, later in that year, uh, Iran's top nuclear scientist was taken out in an assassination. And this assassination was actually uh, brought about by Israel. Israel, uh, through the uh, Mossad network uh, of spies, 
uh, arranged a, this tremendously uh, um, complicated uh, but well executed assassination using a machine gun and artificial intelligence uh, that was developed by Israel to take out this uh, chief nuclear scientist, uh, weapon scientist uh, of Iran. And uh, prior to that taking place, just a few days before, these four met in Saudi Arabia in a secret meeting. They secretly met uh, in a place called Neom in Saudi Arabia. And there at that meeting was the Crown Prince, Bin Salman, and uh, Mike Pompeo, who was representing Donald Trump, and uh, Mr. Trump knew all about the plan too. Uh, the head of the Mossad, Yossi Cohen, uh, from Israel, and Prime Minister Netanyahu. And they met secretly at this uh, place in Saudi Arabia called Neom on the 22nd of December, five days before this uh, nuclear scientist was assassinated. And uh, they met down there uh, where um, Crown Prince uh, Ben Salman uh, is beginning to develop this futuristic mega city in Neom. Uh, it's positioned there in the Gulf of Aqaba, uh, right near the entrance uh, there, and uh, it's it's very close to uh, Egypt, and uh, right there in the Gulf of Aqaba, between Egypt, uh, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, and Israel, and uh, it's uh, seen as it's going to be developed over the next um, close on ten years, as being a, a great link between those countries potentially. What happened was that. Israel uh, didn't uh, have anybody uh, actually on the ground for the assassination in uh, Iran. Uh, they uh, checked where this uh, scientist drove his car to work in uh, most mornings, and uh, they set up on the back of a uh, pickup truck in the area there, uh, this uh, remotely controlled uh, uh, high-powered uh, weapon, um, which, they could, uh, which they set up robotically, uh, and uh, using art artificial intelligence worked out all the uh, necessary uh, arrangements uh, for that uh, assassination to take place, shooting bullets into the car, uh, using uh, facial recognition software to ensure that uh, he was the driver, his wife was sitting alongside just 10 inches away and she wasn't hit by any of the bullets. Um, the uh, satellite control operated from a thousand miles away, worked out all sorts of uh, uh, calculations uh, using the artificial intelligence to work out uh, the speed of the vehicle, uh, the uh, likely uh, uh, recoil of the machine gun after each shot, uh, making minor adjustments to ensure that the, the shots all went in in the same direction, uh, and uh, all sorts of uh, artificial intelligence was employed there. And then, of course, after the assassination took place, uh, they remotely exploded. Uh, the vehicle and the weapon uh, uh, bombed, the bomb went off uh, within the vehicle and all the evidence disappeared. So uh, nobody could quite work out what had taken place until long after the event. Well, uh, with Mohammed bin Salman being uh, informed, whether in full detail of what was going to happen five days later after their meeting, or uh, whether or not uh, he was told or just told to watch what we're going to do in Iran. Uh, I'm quite sure after seeing that, that happen, and uh, Iran being one of the great enemies of Saudi Arabia, and this great scientist being taken out of the picture, I think he thinks to himself, well, uh, I want one of those. Israel's got those. I'm very happy I want to share my, uh, share them to share their artificial intelligence in many ways with me and that would motivate him a long way towards wanting to make a, a deal with Israel. But there are many other reasons why he would want to make a deal with Israel too. Part of it is this development of Neom, uh, a fantastic uh, new city, uh, costing at least $500 billion to uh, uh, put together in this region, which has been largely unoccupied in Saudi Arabia. Uh, estimates now are taking it out much, much more than $500 billion. Um, first stage is projected to open in 2025. Well, they're on the way. Uh, construction is certainly taking place there now. Full completion by 2030. And the central city uh, is going to be called the Line. Now, that's, you can see the red line on the map there uh, under the name Neom. Uh, that's actually the extent of the city that's going to be built. 170 kilometres long, but only 200 metres wide. Uh, and the reason being that uh, there'll be no cars, no roads, 
uh, a rail link running right the way through and everybody uh, living 100 metres one side or the other of that city with all the facilities at their disposal and uh, no need for cars. Perhaps there'll be um, uh, some flying taxis, they say. Um, no carbon emissions and accommodating up to 9 million people. Uh, that uh, picture there is uh, on the NEOM uh, website. It's uh, not going to look perhaps quite like that. Uh, you can see the, the little dots there are the flying taxis. Uh, all sorts of things could come from this. It's, it's going to be the, uh, the most modern city in the world, new future, uh, the prince is calling it. And uh, the question is, uh, in 20 years' time, they estimate to have about 9 million people. Where are those people going to come from? Saudi Arabia's present population is only 36 million, so that's a, a quarter of their population. Given a little bit of growth, almost a quarter of their population. Where will they come from? Well, there's a suggestion that they may well come from amongst uh, the Arabs who are currently refugees here and there, and possibly the Palestinians. Who can tell? But the, we're going to look at the Bible just to give us some more of an idea of what this is all about. So what's the benefits of a deal with Saudi Arabia and what relevance has it got to do with what's happening in Palestine at the moment? Well, there'll be more uh, US support guaranteed uh, for Israel. Uh, if, if this uh, deal is done, of course, uh, President Biden wants to have this peace deal uh, worked out before he ends his presidency, whether that will happen or not, you know, in that space of time, it's hard to tell at the moment. But for Israel, what do they gain from it? Regional security, cooperation, uh, defence in other words, a buffer against the threat from Iran, uh, with uh, Saudi Arabia more on side, with America more on side as a result of uh, doing this uh, peace deal. Uh, military intelligence can be shared uh, between uh, more countries, the Arab countries uh, sharing their intelligence with Israel. Israel will sell lots of technology to uh, Arab countries. Uh, air and shipping and rail links, we'll talk about that more in just a moment. Um, the economic benefits for the whole region cooperating together and uh, assistance in solving the Palestinian question. And as you saw, MBS, Mohammed bin Salman, thinks he thought before the blow up uh, with, uh, you know, with the uh, Palestinian invasion, uh, Hamas invading the southern areas of Israel. Before that, uh, things looked pretty good. There were lots of things being worked out. And uh, so far as bin Salman was concerned, uh, as long as, not necessarily there was a Palestinian state, but as long as the Palestinians had their life eased, uh, that would be sufficient for Saudi Arabia to go ahead with the deal. For them, uh, they would have a, great, a, a closer cooperation with the United States for security, uh, weapons agreements, they want to have uh, more, uh, buy more weapons from Israel, uh, from uh, America and have uh, America support them militarily. Um, and also uh, be between the US and Israel, who are very advanced in nuclear technology as well, uh, civil, civil and possibly military nuclear technology shared with Saudi Arabia. Uh, because Saudi Arabia has said in that uh, interview with MBS, he said, if if Iran gets a nuclear weapon, we've got to have one too, and we will get their technology from for that. Now, Israel too, water desalination technology is fantastic, best in the world, and uh, if Saudi Arabia want to open up the deserts, they don't have a, a, a river running through Saudi Arabia anywhere, uh, they need fresh water and they need desalination for their developments along the coast. And that would include Neom. Uh, Israel's artificial intelligence advancements, AI. Israel is one of the leading countries in the world uh, in their development of AI. And you saw that in uh, regard to that weapon uh, used to uh, carry out that assassination. The Arabian Peninsula's ports and uh, rail project, well, that's a, a big one that uh, Netanyahu has spoken about at the United Nations. Um, and uh, actually competitive to uh, China's um, Belt and Rail Initiative, uh, this new initiative coming through the uh, area of Arabia and up through Israel, uh, which I'll show on the map in just a second, um, is a big deal. It's a, a, big, uh, a big advantage for all uh, the uh, transport of goods from India and Asia through the region. Economic benefits for the region, development of the Neom City of the Future, as it's called. 
Now, at the United Nations recently, uh, Netanyahu showed a map which enraged the Palestinians because it didn't show a Palestinian state separately. Uh, but he showed a, a map, and you can see on the map there the countries which uh, have been cooperating together and with Saudi Arabia cooperating in a deal too. That opens up the potential for a huge transport corridor running from the Indian Ocean right up through the Arabian Peninsula, out through and, and through Jordan and out through Haifa or a port nearby there, and uh, on through the Mediterranean and off to Europe to transport uh, goods manufactured in the east and bring them right across um, to the west. So it's planned to bring goods from India and beyond through the seaports and high-speed rail links in Saudi Arabia and Israel and on to European markets. So the plan bypasses the shipping choke points at the entry to the Persian Gulf, uh, which of course Iran could block off and has done actually in the past, um, so that shipping can't pass through the Strait of Hormuz into the Persian Gulf and uh, out from there as well. Uh, the Red Sea uh, is capable of being blocked off at its narrow entry, you can see it on the map there, and also the Suez Canal. So this is regarded by both um, Prime, Minister, Prime Minister Netanyahu and MBS of Saudi Arabia as a new path to prosperity for all of the Middle East. Wow. Now when we come to this uh, Operation Alexa Flood, is it going to succeed or won't it? The foundation has been laid to the uh, Dome of the Rock in 688 AD. And from that time, uh, no Jews were going to be allowed to worship anywhere near that area, their uh, sacred Temple Mount. Uh, the Arabs took it over completely. That's the area where Solomon's Temple was. And uh, from 688 AD, when the foundation was laid, the uh, construction commenced, that building became known as the abomination that maketh desolate. It was set up as per the prophet Daniel. Daniel chapter 12. So that was the commencement of a very, very significant time period where the abomination that maketh desolate, described in Daniel, is set up for a period of time. Now, it's set up for three periods of time, actually, in Daniel chapter 12, verse 7, verse 11, and verse 12, all commencing in 688 AD, when the abomination that maketh desolate was established. Now, I do have other videos uh, on this channel, which you can look at, which talk about the time periods of the prophecy of Daniel. Just going to reinforce that from this perspective, that the Dome of the Rock uh, is the center of the current conflict when you uh, when it's named Operation Al-Aqsa Flood, it brings the Dome of the Rock right into play. Now the Bible's got three periods in Daniel chapter 12, those three verses mentioned there. Uh, 1260 days or years, time times and the dividing of time, time times and a half, equates to 1,260 years on the day for a year principle. From 688 to 1948, the first um, time period was to finish when the scattering of the people was finished. And that happened in 1948. Israel could no longer be scattered. That's the key word from verse 7 of Daniel 12. Uh, from uh, verse 11, we have uh, a period of time where from the establishment of the abomination that maketh desolate, when sacrifices could no longer be offered by Jewish people on that mount, 1290 years. And in, after 1290 years, 1978 arrived, and that was the time, the year of the Camp David Accords, when the Egyptian president, during the discussions around the Camp David Accords and the peace arrangement between Egypt and Israel, made a clear statement in writing that the holy sites in the city of Jerusalem should be freely accessible for all peoples to go and worship. Now that of course included the area of the Temple Mount and uh, the area where the Dome of the Rock now sits. So that would incorporate the uh, concept that has never really been fully brought to pass that the Jewish people could go up to that area to worship. Now they've been unable to do so uh, right up until now. But in the last few years more and more Jews have been going up and praying, in fact, on the Temple Mount. And uh, in the last year, 50,000 Jews went up to the Temple Mount. And of course, the Arab peoples there, and particularly led by Hamas now, 
are saying that's not that shouldn't be happening. The Jewish people shouldn't be allowed to go up to the area of Al Aqsa, that is the Temple Mount, round the area of the Dome of the Rock there. They shouldn't be allowed to do so. So this area is in play. Jewish people want the freedom to go up to worship on their most holy site. And the Arabs want to stop them because it's their third most holy site. Well, 1978 was a turning point because it was the first time that a Muslim leader said all peoples, in meaning including not only Christians but Jews as well as Muslims, should be able to go up there. And that was the beginning of the end of the Dome of the Rock. Now it's in play. 1335 years, verse 12 of Daniel 12 tells us, Blessed is he who waits. 1335 years, another 45 years from 1978. Blessed is he who waits until that day. And the very next phrase is, Daniel, you'll under, <laughs> everyone will understand these things, and you will stand in your lot. You will be resurrected to see that wonderful time. Is it 2023? The exact date that Daniel will be raised from the dead. We don't know that exactly yet. But we do know that this is a highly significant year in Bible prophecy. Blessed is he who waits to see that day. Chapter 3 is a chapter about Armageddon and the time surrounding Armageddon. In Joel chapter 3, we read the, these words in the first couple of verses, and uh, these verses deal with the Battle of Armageddon, and then they're taken up again from verse 9, more about the Battle of Armageddon. Behold, in those days and in that time when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem, now, the captive, captivity of Judah was brought again in 1948 when Israel returned uh, to their land and became a nation. They couldn't be captive anymore. And the captivity of Jerusalem was brought, about, uh, brought to an end in 1967 when the Jewish armies entered the city of Jerusalem and took control of it. And so Israel became the sovereign nation over the city of Jerusalem. So the captivity has been returned. Then, says God, I will gather all nations and bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat. This is the valley of judgment of the last days, the, the battle of Armageddon. I will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. Verse 9 goes on similarly. Again, verse 12 about the battle of the valley of Jehoshaphat, the valley where God judges the nations. Proclaim ye this among the Gentiles. Prepare war. Wake up the mighty men, let all the men of war draw near, let them come up. Verse 12, let the heathen, that is the nations, the unbelievers around the world, be wakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there will I sit to judge all the nations round about. Now in the middle of that, between verses, well, verses 4 to 8, in that right sandwich in that section of the Bible about Armageddon, are some verses about how the Palestinian question is going to be solved. This is really, really important to what's happening right now over there between Israel and the Palestinians. And it's going to involve Lebanon as well. Read these verses with me. Yea, and what have you to do with me, O Tyre and Zidon, that is the areas of Lebanon, coastal Lebanon, and all the coasts of Palestine, Palestinians. Will ye render me a recompense? <coughs> and if ye recompense me, swiftly and speedily will I return your recompense upon your own head. Because ye have taken my silver and my gold, and have carried into your temples my goodly pleasant things. The children also of Judah and the children of Jerusalem have ye sold unto the Grecians. Now this is all in time gone by. People living in those areas 
were very happy to see the people of Israel taken off and into captivity and, and in fact scattered amongst the nations and they went in and plundered what was left. Your children of uh, Judah and Jerusalem have you sold to the Grecians. This is more or less, you know, uh, assisting and supporting and the spreading abroad of the people of Israel to other countries, Grecians, the areas of Europe, that you might remove them far from their border. Behold, I will raise them up. Now, this has happened in the last hundred years. I will raise them up out of the place whither you have sold them and will return your recompense upon your own head. Yes, you are going to have God recompensing you for what you've done to his people upon your own head. And I will sell, says God, your sons and your daughters, your descendants, the people living in the land now in the area of Gaza and also up there in Lebanon, your daughters into the hands of the children of Judah, and they shall sell them to the Sabaeans, to a people far off, for the Lord has spoken it. The Sabaeans. You know, Back in Old Testament times, there are, these are mentioned, the people of Sheba and the people of Dedan, the Dedanim, Isaiah 21, verse 13, the travelling companies of Dedanim. These are good descriptions of the nomadic tribes of Arabia all down through history, the travelling companies. At times they were more settled, other times they were marauders. The Sabaeans came uh, and uh, did terrible uh, things to Job and his family and his property. Job chapter 1 verse 15. And collectively these people are called the Sabaeans, the people of Sheba. The Sabaeans of Joel chapter 3 and verse 8. Of course this is the area from which the Queen of Sheba came to visit Solomon from down in Arabia. Now, just going in a little bit more detail on these verses. And you can see the headings and the descriptions of the verses. What are you trying to do with me? That is, what, are you, what can you do to God? I mean, God is, is way, way up there in heaven. What can we do to him personally? Nothing. But what these people are doing here by attacking God's people, they are, as we saw earlier, God says, these are the apple of my eye. You're touching my eye. You, what are you trying to do with me? What have you to do with me, O Tyre and Zidon and all the coasts of Palestine? As we said, this is the only time in the Bible you'll read the name Palestine. So it has to do, obviously, with Palestinians today because uh, the area hasn't been known as Palestine for a long time in history until more recently, you know, in the last century or so. The name Palestine was given prior to that. It was Syria and other names. Will you render me a recompense, payback? Will you... Recompense me? Will you do something to me through attacking my people? Well, I'm going to speedily and swiftly return your recompense upon your own head. Historically, you plundered my temple, you took all my uh, treasures, you celebrated and participated when my people were driven out of their land, and that's true in history and in the Bible. We can see that. Because you've taken my silver and my gold, carried away to your temples, my goodly pleasant things, God's good things, uh, from his temple and, uh, and worship uh, associated things taken away by the countries around when Israel were being persecuted and driven off into other countries. <clears throat> so you were involved in selling my people to the Grecians. Now in the original language that is the uh, Hebrew word Javan which represents uh, Greek, Greece and other countries around that in Europe. Now then we know that the, the people of Israel um, Israelites were, were scattered particularly uh, in, in former years right throughout Europe and uh, so many of them uh, lived in Europe uh, uh, down through the centuries and were persecuted from place to place and pogroms took place uh, in uh, Europe and Eastern Europe and Russia and so on all those countries where they were driven from place to place and had no rest for the sole of their feet as the Bible says well historically <coughs> You were involved in driving them from their land. But God brings his people Israel back in the latter days. Verse 7 of Joel 3. Behold, I will raise them out of the place whither ye have sold them and return your recompense upon your own head. So God will ensure that Israel takes control of the Palestinians and of Lebanon. So Hezbollah, you've got a future coming where God will be judging you too. Whether they're involved in this war directly, it seems as though they might be. But God will take control of them and Israel will then take control of them and work with Saudi Arabia to determine what their future 
will be. I'll sell you and your sons and your daughters in the hand of the children of Judah. As you've sold my people, they will sell you to the Sabaeans. That is the area of Saudi Arabia and uh, thereabouts. The people are far off. Now, whether they'll actually be totally uprooted from the land they occupy now and uh, relocated, deported to Saudi Arabia, that's the implication there. Well, it doesn't say it directly in so many words, but that's the implication. You sell my people off elsewhere, I will sell you to the Sabaeans, the people are far off. For the Lord hath spoken it. Will some of them go to the great city of Neom that's planned? Well, that's a possibility. And uh, we shall see what will happen in due course. But Saudi Arabia and perhaps other Arab states nearby that are friendly with them uh, will sort out the Palestinian and Lebanon questions. So this is a prophecy concerning the time the nations are preparing for Armageddon right now. Tyre and Sidon and all the coasts of Palestine. And uh, all nations in the first few verses are gathered to the valley of Jehoshaphat. Verse 9 takes it up again. Prepare war, wake up the mighty men. Let them all come near for the battle of Armageddon. Verses 4 to 8, Lebanon and the Palestinians sold into the hands of the Sabaeans. So let's look at Lebanon briefly. Why is Lebanon in such a terrible state? Well, this That's certainly a part of it. And Lebanon was already in huge trouble uh, before that took place. Lebanon's really been in, in a crisis for, for decades. Uh, part of the problem is this terrible paralysis because uh, after France gave them their independence, uh, France still has uh, some influence over what happens there, but not much these days in Lebanon. Um, the, uh, a constitution was drawn up whereby um, the different uh, religious, religious factors in the country uh, were, were all given some appeasement by uh, giving them roles in governing the country. Uh, the country is about 50% Christian, 50% Muslim. And of the Muslims, uh, about half of them are Sunni and the other half are Shiite. So they all had to be taken into account. And there are various splinter groups amongst all of them as well. Uh, the Constitution says that uh, the Parliament and the bureaucracy each have to be split 50-50 between Christians and Muslims. And there are all these party factions and there's terrible corruption prevails as well as political paralysis in the country. For example, uh, the president... Uh, is uh, meant to be a Maronite Christian, uh, but uh, that uh, his uh, his time ran out, his period of office expired, and they haven't been able to elect another president uh, for uh, uh, over a year now, uh, since October last year. The Prime Minister has to be a Sunni. Uh, the uh, Speaker of the Parliament has to be a Shiite. Um, this power sharing creates terrible political chaos, the, the Prime Minister is only a caretaker Prime Minister at the moment and has been for a while because the previous Prime Minister and uh, his father before him and that family were all found to be terribly corrupt. So uh, a new, uh, new Prime Minister had to be appointed, but he hasn't been totally confirmed yet. Um, the previous President, uh, the Maronite Christian, he had, uh, in order to govern, he had to have a memor memorandum of understanding with Hezbollah, Christians and Hezbollah, trying to get together how can a country really operate under those sort of circumstances. And there's the flag in the middle there of the uh, Hezbollah, the party of Allah, uh, with the uh, machine gun lifted high there. Uh, that's their flag. That's the kind of people they are. Uh, the caretaker prime minister, on the other hand, uh, has uh, he knows it's important to keep on good terms with Saudi Arabia because they're doing a lot of the funding of the country even at this time. Hezbollah, on the other hand, are backed by Iran and Syria, and you can't do anything in Lebanon without their approval. And of course, they are the great um, military uh, uh, wing uh, of uh, of the country. Uh, and I've been uh, I've read that there are more than a hundred thousand rockets they've got aimed at Israel right now in southern Lebanon. Joel chapter three says. 
What have you got to do with me? Will you render me a recompense, you people of that area, Tyre and Zidon, Lebanon and Palestine? I will return your recompense, which means it's payback time. It's God's payback time. And we will see that unfold in the very near future. Uh, well, it's begun already, really. But what does God think of Israel? What sort of country is Israel from God's point of view? Why does God love Israel? Well, Jesus is going to return as the king of the Jews. The Bible's clear on that. He will take up his uh, rightful role. He was crucified king of the Jews. It's been advertised to all the world now for 2,000 years, and he's going to return very soon to take up that rightful role. What about Israel in the meantime? Now, in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul, who was, of course, himself a Jew too, says he loved his brethren, but they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. Now, he writes in Romans chapter 11, he says, I would not that you should be ignorant of this mystery. This is a secret that you need to understand, believers. He says, don't be wise in your own conceits. Don't think you're better than the Jewish people, that uh, the Jewish people are finished. He says, blindness in part has happened to Israel. They do have a sense of religion, most of them, most of them. Uh, they certainly have uh, strong religious uh, and cultural traditions that are based on their religion. Many of them are highly religious, as we know. But they are blind in part. They know a lot about their Old Testament, but they don't know much about Jesus and the Gospel from that time on. Blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. In other words, in time, until God has finished calling people from other nations to know the Gospel. Fortunately, we still have a moment in time left for us amongst the Gentile nations, to be to learn the gospel of the hope of Israel. And so he goes on to say, the Apostle Paul, and so all Israel shall be saved. And by that he means believers who are spiritually Israelites, that is us amongst the Gentiles who believe this gospel of the Bible and the hope of Israel, and the natural people too, who will see Jesus when he returns and look upon the wounds in his hands and mourn and re recognize their error in all the time past. But all Israel shall be saved, as it is written. There shall come out of Zion the Deliverer, of course Jesus, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is God's covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins, says God. So God will forgive them. He'll forgive them for the crucifying of his son. And remember it was Jews and Gentiles, the Romans too, who were involved in the crucifixion of Jesus. He will take away, God says, I will take away all their sins, the same as I'm prepared to forgive the sins of Gentile believers even now. And of course, there are some Jewish believers now too, but not very, very many. You see, God made the promises to Abraham way, way back in the book of Genesis because Abraham was the most faithful man following the flood when God saw that the things were deteriorating again and men and, men, men and women were becoming more and more sinful again. He called Abraham and said, I'm going to have to work through you. I promised I'd never destroy the earth with a flood again. I can build a faithful following of believers down through history through you, Abraham. <clears throat> and I will make of thee a great nation, God says. That is Israel. I will bless thee and make thy name great. And thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. All families of the earth can be blessed. Why should people be railing against the Jewish people now? Cursing them. God says, I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. And that, of course, is going to become even clearer, but it's happened down through history. Any nation that's gone against the Jewish people has eventually ended up cursed. And God has blessed his people, kept them intact, kept them as a people down through centuries when they had no home and brought them back to their home. Now in the same chapter, God said in Genesis 12 verse 7 to Abraham, unto thy seed will I give this land. And in the New Testament we are told in Galatians chapter 3 to look at it and say, seed can be singular or plural. And in the singular, it really means Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus. And in the plural, it means a multitude of people who are children of Abraham. 
and that includes people who are adopted into Abraham's family, such as us believers today. Unto thy seed will I give this land. So this land, the land in which Abraham walked, the land which is occupied in the main by the Jews today, that is the promised land. Unto thy seed am I going to give this land God promised. Then in Genesis chapter 21, he made it clear, because Abraham had more than one child, and uh, two of them in particular, the two uh, born first of all, Ishmael first, Isaac second, God said, between those two, I am choosing Isaac. He is the faithful one, and through him, your children will inherit the land. In Isaac shall thy seed be called. What about the Palestinians and the Arab nations? Has God got a future for them? What does he, what does he think of them? Well, remember, the firstborn of Abraham through the Egyptian handmaid was actually Ishmael. And when Ishmael was about to be born, his mother is told, the Egyptian handmaid of Abraham is told, he will be a wild man, Ishmael. This is the father of the Arab peoples. His hand will be against every man and every man's hand against him. This is a prophecy about the descendants of Ishmael. And he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. They will congregate together. And in fact, they will congregate around Isaac's descendants. So he will dwell in the presence of all his brethren, but he will be a wild man. And uh, you only need to look at what's going on. And of course, down through history, uh, the Arab peoples have really inherited that characteristic of being wild people. But some of them are terribly, terribly, extremely wild, as we've just seen uh, recently, and, and it's been ongoing. But in Genesis chapter 17 of Ishmael, uh, Abraham asked God, will you, will you bless, bless Ishmael? Well, God says, yes, Ishmael, I've heard you. Behold, I have blessed him. So the Arab peoples are a blessed people. They are Semitic people too. They are the, the family of Shem, through whom came Abraham, and known as the Semitic people, and they are blessed. Behold, I have blessed him, I will make him fruitful, I will multiply him exceedingly, we know that. And twelve princes will he beget. So there were the twelve tribes of Israel, and twelve tribes under Ishmael amongst the Arabs. And notice this, and I will make him a great nation. But my favoured seed, my covenant, will I establish with Isaac. That is, of course, the people of Israel. Well, what about the future of the Palestinians and the Arab nations? Yes, they will be there in the kingdom of God. They will be alongside. They will dwell with their brethren, not in the exact promised land, but right nearby. And so this promise in Isaiah chapter 60, which is a prophecy, a chapter which begins, Arise and shine, for thy light has come, the glory of the Lord has risen upon thee. That's the picture of the kingdom, the return of the Lord Jesus Christ and the enlightenment of the world. In that kingdom, we read about the Arabs. What's their future? Notice this, the multitude of camels shall cover thee. This is covering the land near Israel. The dromedaries of Midian and Ephah, all they of Sheba shall come. So this is again, this is the Sabaeans, these are the Arabs of the Arabian Peninsula. What are they going to come? They're very wealthy. They shall bring gold and incense, and they shall show forth the praises of the Lord. All the flocks of Kedar. Now Kedar was one of the great sons of Ishmael. Other Arab names here, Nebaioth. They shall be gathered together unto thee. The rams of Nebaioth shall minister unto thee. They will come up and offer sacrifices in the great temple of the future age. They shall come up with acceptance on mine altar. And I will glorify the house of my glory. Now in the same chapter, Isaiah 60 verse 13, Lebanon is mentioned too. So the Arabian countries and Lebanon will come to thee. <coughs> uh, Psalm 72 is a very beautiful chapter about the kingdom of God on earth when the Lord Jesus will have rule from sea to sea and from the river unto the ends of the earth. Psalm 72 says, when the Lord Jesus Christ reigns. So in that chapter we read, uh, in that psalm, the kings of Sheba and Seba will come to the king and will offer gifts to the Lord Jesus Christ. Sheba, the areas of Arabia, Seba is an area within Africa. They shall offer gifts, yea, all kings shall fall down before him, all nations shall serve him. So there is a future in God's plan, a quite a glorious future for the Palestinians and the Arab nations who are 
as we said, descendants of Abraham, not the seed through whom the great promise would come, the Jewish people, but brothers of the Jewish people. They will be in the great kingdom of God. So when the Lord Jesus Christ returns, in summary, we will mention these things because they are clear from the prophecies that uh, all the walls around Israel will come down. They will dwell peacefully with those around them, their neighbours. Uh, there won't be any terrorists anywhere near them. Uh, they will uh, be dwelling confidently and safely on the land, in the land, on the mountains of Israel, which includes the areas of the West Bank too. Uh, all those areas are going to be occupied by Israel as a nation. They'll dwell safely. They'll be prosperous. This is not very far away, by the way. <coughs> so what we're seeing happening now in the Middle East is going to bring a conclusion pretty quickly. What's going to happen is the king of the north, that is Russia and other countries who'll come with Russia in that last day will eye the prize. They'll descend like a storm, but they will come to their end in the battle of Armageddon. The Lord Jesus Christ will intervene. Zechariah 14 tells us quite plainly that uh, Jesus' feet will come to the Mount of Olives and the Mount of Olives will split in two. There'll be a great earthquake. It's also mentioned in Ezekiel 38, the great earthquake, uh, through which the nations who've come against Jerusalem to destroy finally try to destroy the Jewish people, will not succeed and Jesus will intervene and become the judge of the world and ultimately the king of the world, ruling in peace from Jerusalem. So God loves Israel, as we've said. And Jeremiah 31 says from God's words, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. It's never changed. He's always loved his people. They've gone away from him on many occasions in time gone by, but he's brought them back. He loves them and he's brought them back in these last days to eventually show them their great saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. Psalm 78. He chose the tribe of Judah, the Mount Zion, which is, of course, where the abomination that maketh desolate sits now. Mount Zion, the great place of worship of the future time where the temple was built in time gone by, the Mount Zion which God loved. He built his sanctuary there, like high places, palaces, like the earth which he hath established forever. Psalm 122, beautiful words that we all should be uttering now. We should all be praying for the peace of Jerusalem. That's the glorious future God has promised beyond all the present troubles. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. They shall prosper that love thee. Peace be within thy walls and prosperity within thy palaces. Yes, Jesus will rule the world from Jerusalem. How we all long for that day.